want to welcome you back from your mid semester break. And if you're willing and able, please stand with us and worship.
I've carried a burden for too long on my own, and I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now I'm laying it down And I know that I need you I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding No reason to wait My heart needs a surgeon My soul needs a friend So I run to the Father again and again and again and again Oh, oh, oh You saw my condition I had a plan from the start Redemption, the price for my heart. And I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand, I can't comprehend. All I know is I need you. I run to the Father. I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding No reason to wait My heart needs a surgeon My soul needs a friend So I run to the Father again And again and again and again Oh, 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 oh Again My soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again. Run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, the reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon, my soul found a friend, so I run to the Father again and again. Sing over me, and I receive your mercy. Your 
faithfulness is clear to see. It's constant every day. In the morning you sing over me. And I receive your mercy. Your faithfulness is clear to see. It's like the sunrise. It's constant every day. Every breath I breathe an invitation to believe you are creating something good. Though this season doesn't tell my story, I know you're with mountains for me. You're just that good. So I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough. Cause he's more than enough.
heart's not worried, he knows what I need. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for letting us be here together. Thank you for letting us get back from mid-semester break safely. Thank you for getting us through what seems to be getting towards the end of the pandemic. Masks are optional now. Thank you for the opportunity. Please just continue to bless us and bless the words that we're about to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, thank you, band, for leading us this morning. Um, Mid-semester break happened, and you are here. Congratulations. I think that's good. Um, I always feel kind of weird at the middle point of the semester. I don't know about y'all. Like, it's, yeah, there's still some things to go, but we've done some stuff. So I find that this is the time where it's easy to kind of, like, start, oh, my goodness, there's so many things to do, but also I've done a lot already. And, Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do something that I hope you'll remember to do. You have to, or else, you know. Um, let's take some deep breaths together. Can, can we do that? Is that, like, too, like, basic? I hope it's not. So it's nice to kind of breathe in through the nose, you know, and out through the mouth, you know. Like, do a couple of these, you know, breathe in. Breathe out. Um, in this kind of sprint to the end of the semester, I, I hope that literally and figuratively that you Remember to take time to pause, to, to breathe in this season, uh, because that's a good idea. Um, before uh, I'll have the opportunity to introduce our speaker in a moment, um, I have a couple of announcements and kind of reminders that I would like to share. So first of all, well, you'll notice um, around you, and you know, um, there have been some changes in our L.A. County health guidelines and things like that related to, well, let's talk about it, related to chapel. So um, you probably noticed that around us, there's some who are wearing these, there's some who are not. Uh, it is true, masks are now optional, not required. In, I think, pretty much everywhere around APU, uh, chapel is one of those. Uh, can, so that is true until we hear other updates, right? That's kind of how it's been. Uh, can I just kind of speak the word hospitality over us when it comes to the way that we choose to or not to use these things in settings? Um, let's let this continue to be a place that we're looking out for each other more than ourselves. Amen? Can we do that? Um, whether you choose to partake in mask wearing or not, let's, let's think of each other well um, in this season. So, but that's going to be the case for chapels until there's some other, you know, mandate. Uh, masks are optional. Uh, second thing, this was announced two weeks ago, I think now. Um, but a small change coming to our kind of chapel modality and format. So there's those of us in the room and those of us online. Hi, of you online. I can't see you, but I trust you're there. Um, beginning next week, um, there will be only one kind of online asynchronous option for chapels, and that'll be our Friday reflections. Those are still going to be happening. Other than that, um, we are going to be kind of a uh, taking a step towards our fall 2022 that we hope will be kind of more fully in person for our chapels. So... Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursday nights in Kaleo um, are here. We will not have those Tuesday, Thursday asynchronous options, but we'll still have the Friday reflections asynchronous. Um, note, uh, we just kind of assume and understand that, that some students might have uh, specific needs um, for, uh, uh, for exemptions or accommodations kind of in this. So uh, there's a way for you to do that. Our Office of Judicial Affairs is accepting petitions um, for uh, exemptions to this, if you want to continue the um, online chapel um, uh, modality and you meet certain criteria, uh, you can do that. There's uh, an, an email that will be going out this week. Um, it's all over our social media. And if you look back at that email a couple weeks ago, there is a petition link. Fill it out. Send it in. It is due this Thursday, March 17th. If you want a petition for continuing online chapel, Thursday, March 17th, be sure to get that in. Okay, I think those are my announcements for chapel and COVID and those kinds of things. Um, before I introduce our speaker, um, kind of to shift gears here, um, 
Uh, I want to acknowledge something kind of significant that happened in our community uh, just a couple weeks ago, right before, uh, right before break. Um, so you likely saw uh, the update from um, our president and others that uh, one of our own students, um, Sydney Benveniste, uh, passed away a couple weeks ago. Um, a junior here at APU, a member of our swimming and diving team, a public relations major, um, a friend to many. I just want to kind of say this in this space. This is the first that we've actually been uh, in chapel since uh, we've had a chance to acknowledge this. Um, this, this is, a, this is a, a big deal. This is something that is important. Um, whether, whether we knew her personally, um, or whether we were part of those groups, um, or even just part of being part of the student body, um, this, is, uh, this is something that holds weight, doesn't it? Um, it's something that matters and impacts each of us a little bit differently. Um, so uh, can I just offer a, a friendly kind of reminder? Um, whatever feelings or reactions you may have are real, are valid, um, and seeking support in a time like this is normal, natural, and a good idea. Um, so, so lend support to each other um, as you can. And, and we've got a great university counseling center. Um, our campus ministry office offers uh, pastoral care and counseling. Um, and, and there's many others on campus who are just great and would love to listen, to be a support in whatever way. Um, yeah, as we provide support for each other, uh, just know that it is a good thing to be able to lean on others in difficult times. Um, so uh, if it's all right, can I offer a prayer for our community, for uh, Sydney's family, and, um, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Let's, let's pray together. Well, Lord, we thank you that you are a God that we can come to at any time. And uh, Lord, in this transition time of the semester, we pause and we think about our, our colleague, our fellow student, Sydney. Um, we are grateful for her life, um, for the impact that she has made among uh, many here and, and elsewhere. Uh, Lord, is, uh, this is a loss. Um, we name that and we ask for your help. We ask that you would be near to uh, those especially who have been closest to her, um, to her family, to her friends, roommates, teammates, classmates, faculty. Uh, and Lord, uh, as a, just a student body, as a community of APU, um, when one of us suffers, we all suffer. Um, Lord, would there be space and room for, for grieving, for, for good memories, for, um, uh, for whatever it is that you want to do in this season? Um, Lord, we, we honor her. Um, and we, uh, we thank you that we have a context to be able to process, to grieve. I thank you that you are a God who allows for that. And Lord, uh, for any who might even feel like this reminds them of other losses in their lives or, or that this is uh, just not the easiest thing to, um, to process, Lord, would there be great opportunities for support, uh, for conversation, for prayer? Um, thank you that you are a God who allows for our processing. We ask that you'd be near to this community in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, so, uh, thanks for letting us do that for a moment. Um, I uh, would love now to introduce our speaker. Um, so this morning we get to hear uh, from one of our own, um, a faculty member in the School of Nursing. I wonder if we have any of those. Yeah, okay, a little, little shout over there. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you, can, you can clap for, you know, being a nursing student. That's a good thing, yeah. I know not all of you are nursing students, but I know that you appreciate that we have those. Uh, so, uh, Professor Ari Smith uh, is an instructor here in the School of Nursing. She received her degrees from right here at APU and from UCLA. Um, her life's work as a pediatric nurse is to help improve the lives of women and their families. Um, as an instructor in the, the School of Nursing, her passion is to educate nursing students who care for patients holistically and hold an image of the inherent dignity and worth of every patient. Um, so her areas of research include uh, the development of a community education and empowerment program for adolescent girls um, and initiatives aimed at reducing health disparities for African American women in LA County. Uh, her family, she has three teenage sons and 17 years ago, 
uh, she and her husband Josh uh, planted and currently pastor a church in Monrovia called Mountainside Communion. Um, she loves being active outdoors. Um, she says her favorite thing is a good meal surrounded by family, which I relate to that. Uh, and she actually really does come highly recommended by her students and her colleagues. Uh, would you please join me in welcoming our speaker, Ari Smith. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. It's good to see you all here. You know, I don't get out of the School of Nursing much, so it's so good to be here in Upper Turner with you all. Um, I'm afraid my nursing students might have the reputation of not getting out much, too. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's partly my fault. Um, so, like Jason said, the majority of my career has been spent working, um, helping women have babies. Um, helping families welcome new humans into the world. Uh, and along the way, empowering women to have courage as they birth their babies. I tell students all the time, you get to be a witness to the most significant day in people's lives. So yes, APU, there will be talk of birthing this morning. Get ready. My, my three teenage sons quickly leave the room or get back to their TikTok or Brawl Star or whatever they're doing when I start telling work stories. So hang with me. Um, put that TikTok on hold for 20 minutes. Today we're going to talk about midwives, fear, courage, and Macklemore. All right? In particular, we're going to talk about two women who contributed to one of the greatest stories of liberation in history. So as we get started, we have two amazing nursing students who are going to come and read our passage from Exodus chapter 1. The king of Egypt had a talk with the two Hebrew midwives. One was named Shifra and the other Pua. He said, when you deliver the Hebrew women, look at the sex of the baby. If it is a boy, kill him. If it, if it is a girl, let her live. But the midwives had far too much respect for God mm -hmm. and didn't do what the king of Egypt ordered. They let the boy babies live. The king of Egypt called in the midwives. Why didn't you obey my orders? You've let those babies live. The midwives answered Pharaoh, the Hebrew women aren't like the Egyptian women. Um, they are vigorous. Before the midwives can get there, they've already had the baby. God was pleased with the midwives. The people continue to increase in number, a very strong people. And because the midwives honored God, God gave them families of their own. Awesome, thank you so much for reading our passage. So if you tuned out there, this is a crazy story. Are you ready? We're going to talk about midwives who defied Pharaoh this morning. So before we get into each little part of this passage, I want to kind of just highlight what's going on here. The Israelites are living in slavery and are an oppressed people. In Exodus, a few verses after the passage we're looking at today, we see this beautiful um, message that God gives us. And it says, God says in Exodus 3, I've taken a good long look at the affliction of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries for deliverance from their slave masters. I know all about their pain. And now I have come down to help them. And this is what I want us to focus on, to pry them loose from the grip of Egypt. Get them out of that country and bring them to a good land with wide open spaces. If you don't hear anything else today, the whole point of this story is that God sees our affliction and uses the courage of two women in our story to show us that God sees 
and God understands. So first, uh, the students did a great job of reading kind of challenging names here. Um, I, I want us to note that it says, one was named Shifra and the other Pua. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Hopefully I am. Um, so Pharaoh says you need to kill all the baby boys after you've spent hours with them in delivery. And I want us to focus on the fact that we learn their names here today. So it's not very often that um, women are named in the Old Testament, actually. Um, we don't know exactly, but some think that perhaps these midwives were from modern-day Sudan. Maybe they were Nubian midwives, but knowing their names is not the norm. They must have been important. In a beautiful article titled, Say Their Names, Pua, Shifra, and the Legacy of Black Midwives, author Ebony Johanna discusses the similarities between these two midwives and African-American midwives working in oppressive conditions. She says, black women have been instrumental in birthing and protecting the young since time immemorial. It is a cultural tradition that precedes the black experience in America. As Nubian midwives Shifra and Pua show us, the practice has deep roots in the African continent. Carrying this rich practice with them to America, among many other practices and traditions, black midwives were routinely called on to deliver both black and white women's babies. This article then goes on to talk about just how profound it is that we know these two women's names. I think we know their names because they are crucial to the narrative of the story of God here. So it goes on to say, when you deliver the Hebrew women, look at the sex of the baby. It's a, if it's a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, let her live. Why on earth is Pharaoh doing this? So uh, probably the increasing number of immigrant Hebrew people is concerning and scary for Pharaoh. The outsider is a threat to the, this Pharaoh. It's a threat to him holding power, and he needs to keep them in a place of submission and enslavement. Above, he says, there are way too many of them, and he fears that maybe one day they will rise up against him. Fear. The title of our talk today is Midwives, Fear, Courage, and Macklemore. This is where fear comes in. Pharaoh is afraid. He is afraid of losing control, losing power. And the verse goes on, the passage goes on, and it says they had way too much respect for God and didn't do what Pharaoh ordered. They let the boy babies live. Um, so Pharaoh comes back and says, why did you not do what I asked you to do? And they come up with a plan. They do not do what he says, and they lie and say, these women deliver so fast, we can't get there in time. Brilliant. All of us who work in the birthing world, we know that birth is very unpredictable. Uh, sometimes it happens so fast that we run to the lobby and deliver a baby, or people deliver their babies in the car on the way to the hospital, or sometimes it happens so slow that we're on 48 hours and we think we can't do this another minute. Birth cannot be controlled. And the midwives know this about birth. So they have a challenging situation. They either obey their oppressive, violent boss, or they follow what they are, feel they are morally obligated to do, which is not participate in the genocide of a people group by killing all the baby boys. You know they were afraid. Fear. Uh, they were afraid just like Pharaoh was afraid. But in their fear, they acted. 
They got creative. Their fear propelled these two midwives to action. So some, some scholars say that the word vigorous um, is similar to saying that, the, that these patients are like animals. They deliver too quickly. They're so vigorous. We can't even get there in time. It's actually uh, a derogatory way to speak of these uh, patients of theirs. Um, it's like saying they are like animals. And some scholars say that maybe the midwives were actually using some of Pharaoh's own hateful language in order to deceive him. They knew the language of those in power and they used it to resist the movement of the Pharaoh. And they advocated fiercely for these little boys amidst their fear. They were conniving and clever. And then the passage ends with, but God was pleased with the midwives. Because the midwives were the start to this beautiful unfolding story of God seeking out God's people who were enslaved and oppressed. This is why we know their names. The story of God over and over is about God coming after us, especially those without a voice. Right after this story, we, we learn about how Pharaoh keeps at trying to oppress this group of people. He goes on to say, all baby boys must be thrown into the Nile River. And then there's one baby, Moses, who's saved because of his clever and conniving mother and sister who made sure he was found. Because of them and Pharaoh's daughter who found him, he went on to carry out God's message of redemption. So I wanna read again what God is saying to us. And now I have come down to help them, pry them loose from the grip of Egypt. The whole point of this story today is to show that God saw what was going on with the Israelites. God wanted to pry them loose from the grip of Egypt. Cheryl Townsend Gilks writes about this passage that if it wasn't for the women, there would be no Exodus, no Moses, no liberation of the children of Israel of which to speak. It was the guidance of an entire village of maternal women, mothering women, such as midwives, birth mothers, sisters, and other mothers that gave rise to the greatest liberation mo movement known to human history. These women, Pua and Shifra, whose names we know, defied the Pharaoh despite their fear. So I wanna switch gears a little bit here and I wanna talk about nursing for a few minutes. When Jason asked me to speak, he said, maybe give like an update on nursing, how things have been going. And as you can imagine, the last few years have been a little challenging over in the School of Nursing. Our students have seen things that seasoned nurses have just experienced for the first time. They have become very familiar with death, grieving, and pain. They have had to adapt They've had to get less time in clinical and then more time in clinical. They've had to step in and help their burnt out, overworked nurses. Uh, they have had to answer questions of patients and family members that can't be answered. They've held the phone as we said goodbye on FaceTime. I am so proud of our students. They are so impressive. Their courage amidst their fear 
over the last few years is inspiring. And it has been a heavy few years. We've had so many occasions in which we all needed courage. Fear came in as we masked and gowned up for 12 hours. Fear came in as we worried that our students wouldn't graduate. We all have fear, all of us. But like the midwives we're talking about today, fear is put at bay by courage. And I have to tell you now a little bit about labor. So, I worked in labor and delivery for a long time, and in every mother's birth, birth, there's a phase of labor called the transition phase of labor. My students had to memorize this for their tests. Uh, in the transition phase of labor, this is shortly before the actual birth takes place, women become extremely fearful. It's kind of like they get to this point where they realize there's only one way out. I have to do this. I have to push this baby out and they get really scared. Very normal. And in this phase, we teach our students what's most important here is that the role of the midwife or the labor and delivery nurse is to give courage, to encourage our patients to stay very close in this phase of labor. During this phase, women need their providers to be very strong for them. And sometimes a bit tough. We often say to our patients at this stage of labor, you were made to do this. There's probably 300,000 other women in the world birthing their babies right now. You are not alone. Um, and when we are afraid, it helps to know we are not doing this alone. One of my nurses during one of my deliveries, Kathy, looked at me at a particularly challenging moment and said, Ari, you know it's gonna hurt. Don't be afraid of the pain, keep going. And that moment was life-changing for me. I knew all about birth, but it was in that moment that she gave me courage by telling me, yes, this is so hard, but you can do hard things. Her voice was strong and compassionate and a little stern, and it was exactly what I needed at that time. You know, I can't help but think about the midwives here as they helped women birth their babies, with the fear of Pharaoh looming over them, they also gave courage to their patients, despite their fear, telling, telling their patients as if almost telling themsel themselves, I know you are so scared, I know you are afraid, but you can do this. I imagine the midwives were a very calm, compassionate presence in a place where fear often ruled. They were delivering babies of people who were enslaved. No doubt, fear was surrounding them. So you may not find yourself needing courage to stand up to Pharaoh or courage to deliver a baby here this morning, but I know we all have fear for different reasons. Um, you may fear everything from a bad grade, choosing the wrong major, fear maybe of being vulnerable. Um, and fear manifests itself in all sorts of different ways. It's different for all of us, right? And it can be apathy. Perfectionism, overcommitment, addiction. Um, but I want us to think about what counteracts fear. And that is courage. We overcome our fear by asking God to give us courage. Some of the most courageous people I know are my brothers and sisters who are in recovery who are daily facing down their demons, knowing that every single day is a new start. 
This is how we all should live. Dependent on something other than ourselves, knowing that we cannot do this alone. For many years, those of you, and my students know this, those of you who know me know that I am a big fan of this artist, Macklemore. And it is his vulnerable sharing of his sobriety journey that has kept me a fan all these years. His very honest language surrounding the battle, the daily battle he has to deal with, is inspiring for me. So we're gonna look at a couple of song lyrics from Macklemore that demonstrate his courage. So in the song, St. Ides, he says, but things got so messed up that I had to pray. I used to steal my daddy's Cabernet, never thought it would turn into a rattlesnake. It's this beautiful kind of image of a rattlesnake and his addiction that's powerful here. And then the song goes on to say, I can barely remember last night, and in the morning I swear it's the last time. Where would I be? I know the devil fancies me, but that don't mean that blank gets to dance with me. This imagery of evil wanting to destroy and linger, that Macklemore here courageously calls out and says, but you don't get to dance with me. This is inspiring. This is courage. In his song, Drug Dealer, he references the serenity prayer, which reminds us to have courage daily to face our demons in changing the things that we can change. In his song, Starting Over, he tells of his fears of letting his fans down if, if and when they hear that he relapsed and how he feared being called a fake he says, if I can be an example of getting sober, then I can be an example of starting over. Macklemore's lyrics have been a refuge for so many as they work their sobriety. But think about what if he chose to be silent out of fear of being called a fake? Think about what if the midwives chose, became paralyzed in their fear, if they didn't act with courage to devise a clever scheme to defy the Pharaoh. So as we kind of wrap things up here, I want you to consider a couple things. Consider what Brene Brown says about courage. She says, courage is like a habitus a habit, a virtue. You get it by courageous acts. It's like you learn to swim by swimming. You learn courage by couraging. We talk in my ethics class about how Aristotle says we have to practice at becoming people of virtue. Aristotle says man acquires particular quality by constantly acting a particular way. We become just by performing just actions, temperate by performing temperate actions, brave by performing brave actions. You see, we have to work at this quality. Courage doesn't just show up. We take small, courageous steps every day. This is why the sobriety journey includes daily meetings, reminders of the need to be courageous. I believe, APU, that God wants to pry us loose from the grip of what brings us fear. Maybe we could replace the word Egypt with fear this morning. The story we build our lives around centers on a God who hears our cries, who knows all about our pain, and who wants to help us pry us loose from the grip of whatever it is that has a hold on us. My prayer for you today is that maybe you can at least begin to name what it is that's causing you fear. 
what it is maybe that has a hold on you. This takes work and time. It takes journaling, therapy, talking to friends, asking God to show you the areas of your life that God can maybe pry you loose from. The world needs your courage, APU students. which looks like being vulnerable sometimes and honest. Just like the enslaved people in Egypt, God sees you. God hears your cries and God wants to pry you loose from the grip of whatever it is that's maybe keeping you stuck. So as, as I close, close, I wanna tell you, you are so loved, students. Um, as your faculty, we are here for you and we love you. And even more than that, you are loved by a God who sees you and who wants to pry you loose. So I pray that you have courage as you go from here today. Have a wonderful day.